The four of us are here to prevent the apocalypse. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, here as always with my manager, Doug. And Knock at the Cabin is M. Night Shyamalan's latest film, featuring Drax himself, Dave Bautista, as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Er, that sounds awesome! Right? And the movie takes place in a cabin in the woods. Now do you see right now? We're gonna break down all the biblical symbolism, what each horseman represents, and the mysterious figure lurking in the sunbeams peering through the cabin's windows. And the twist ending! You can't forget about that M. Night signature twist endings. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. So, Knock at the Cabin features a family of three on vacation who are met with a terrible choice. Eric, Andrew, and their daughter, Wynn, must choose one of themselves to sacrifice in order to prevent the apocalypse from happening. Now, the rules are very clear that one member of the family can't simply decide to take their own life. They must choose, as a family, who will be sacrificed, and then one of them must kill the other. It's really an impossible choice, especially when there's like a 99.9% .9 chance that these four wackos holding you hostage are a bunch of deluded religious zealots. Person, I just want you to know, to save this video store and the world, I would sacrifice you to the horsemen. Aw, thanks, buddy. So the film opens with Eric and Andrew's adopted daughter, Wynn, catching grasshoppers. Swarms of grasshoppers, or locusts to be more specific, are often associated with plagues. In the book of Exodus, locusts are listed as one of the ten plagues of Egypt, plagues that were sent by God because the Pharaoh refused to release the Israelites. Let my people go! This is similar to how in the film, a new plague is sent each time the family refuses to sacrifice one of their own, but more on that in just a bit. Swarms of locusts can lead to severe famine and starvation by destroying agricultural crops. Locusts have been feared by society for thousands of years because of the sheer damage they can cause. They've been deemed by the superstitious as a sign of the end of times. But in the modern day era, they're more a sign of a bad Jurassic World movie. So while winds catching grasshoppers, we see Leonard approach. And shortly thereafter, the rest of the horsemen arrive. This group of four all experienced visions warning them of the apocalypse and what they have to do to stop it. The group makes their way into the cabin and ties up Eric and Andrew. After hearing the horsemen spiel, Eric and Andrew understandably think that the horsemen are insane and experiencing a shared delusion, also known as a fala adu. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's also the title of the Joker sequel, a movie that will showcase Joker and Harley Quinn having a shared psychological disorder. This disorder is also called shared delusional disorder and it can include more than two people. This disorder includes hallucinations, which would explain the visions the horsemen are having, as well as the paranoia that one person can pass to another, if that person is susceptible to extreme conspiratorial thinking or if they already suffer from severe psychological trauma. Now, instead of making you wonder throughout the film if the horsemen are crazy cultists or really telling the truth, the movie instead reveals pretty quickly that the apocalypse really is happening. Now, personally, this surprised me because going into the movie, I thought it would follow the 10 Cloverfield Lane formula. Throughout that movie, you find yourself wondering what the heck is really going on above this bunker, if anything at all. You're constantly torn between whether there's an actual apocalypse happening or if John Goodman's character was just a crazy kidnapper. Plot twist, it's both. <laughs> right? But in this movie, it's made pretty clear right up front that yes, there is an apocalypse happening. And yes, it gets worse every time this family refuses to make a choice, a choice of who they will sacrifice. And each time the family says no to the horsemen, the horsemen are to sacrifice one of their own. So who are these other horsemen? Great question. So, like I said, we have Dave Batista's Leonard, Sabrina, Adrian, and Ron Weasley himself, Redmond. Now, in the film, the four horsemen are classified as healing, guidance, nurturing, and malice, as opposed to the traditional death, conquest, famine, and war. So, let's break down which horsemen is which and why they didn't have their more traditional names. Leonard is credited as Guidance, which makes sense considering he's a teacher, and he's also the leader of the horsemen, guiding the group through this quest. This conquest. Yes, conquest. Leonard's guidance is an inverted take on conquest. They share a determination to complete the mission, but their tactics vary. While Leonard's physical appearance is intimidating, he's very soft-spoken and understanding. And in the end, this approach proves to be the right one. Had Leonard been threatening and attempted to force this family to kill one of their own, the apocalypse wouldn't have stopped. Leonard's approach saw to it that this family made the choice on their own, which was the only way to stop the apocalypse. Next, we have Sabrina. She's credited as healing, which fits nicely because she's a nurse. Not only do we see her treat wounds, she also attempts to heal the doubts sown by the absurdity of her and the other's horsemen's claims. So, what's the inversion of healing? Death. Not only does she attempt to heal rather than kill, but her fate is also death. And not in the sacrificial sense. Sabrina takes Wynn's place in the book and falls victim to an accidental gunshot. When Leonard and Andrew are fighting over a handgun, Sabrina is shot. Now, in the book, it was Wynn who was shot and killed. Wynn's death in the book does not stop the apocalypse because it 
was not by choice. Similarly, Sabrina's death by gunshot doesn't count toward her sacrifice, and Leonard is still forced to bash her head in like the other horsemen before them. Next we have Adrian. She's nurturing. The reveal that she's a mother, as well as her attempts to comfort Wynn, perfectly depict her motherly nature. Nurture is also shown through her admiration for nutrition, being that she's a chef. Now the opposite of nutrition is famine, the result of people going without consistent nutrients such as food and water for long periods of time. And finally we have Redmond, who's credited as malice. Malice meaning to seek out conflict and inflicting physical and emotional damage on others. This is showcased not only through his rude and aggressive demeanor, but also the reveal that Redmond was the one who committed a homophobic hate crime on Andrew years prior. Now Redmond isn't really an inversion of his respective horsemen like the others. His counterpart is war, and with Redmond being impatient, aggressive, and violent, he is a perfect representation of the monstrosities of war and those who start them. Well, it is a good foe, absolutely nothing. You can also see visual representation of which horsemen are which in the color of their attire. The colors of the four horses of the apocalypse are white, black, pale, and red. Leonard is wearing white, Adrian black, Sabrina a pale yellowish off-white color, and Redmond is, is red and he also has red in his name and his hair, all matching the colors of their horsemen. Now we think that we may have also seen a fifth horseman, this figure that Eric sees in the sunbeams following his concussion. We see it standing with the horsemen when sacrificing Redmond following the family's first no, and the release of the first plague. Now this figure looks a lot like the Grim Reaper or Death. Also it shares the pale off-white yellowish color of Death's horse, just like Sabrina's shirt. Wait, how can you have two Deaths? Well that's my only hesitation on calling this one Death, because it's clear that Sabrina is the inverse of Death. I suppose it's possible that these new inverted versions of the Four Horsemen exist in a world where the original four once existed as well. After all, Eric did theorize that perhaps families have been met by the Horsemen of the Apocalypse for centuries, families having to make this horrendous choice to save the world time and time again. It happens again and again and again. Now, earlier in the film, we hear Wynn say that Studio Ghibli's Kiki's Delivery Service is her favorite movie, a movie that at its core is about finding your true purpose in life and fulfilling that purpose. This parallels perfectly the peace that Eric found in knowing that his true purpose was to be sacrificed by his family and save the world. So now let's talk about that twist ending or lack thereof. Yeah, stop it, stop it, nope, nope, can't afford it. M. Night movies are notorious for their twist endings, a reveal that makes the entire story turn on its head, but also makes so much sense. Take movies like The Sixth Sense, Unbreakable, and The Village, for example. Oh, do you mean when Bruce Willis' ghost gets superpowers and fights a monster in the woods? That's all the movies at once, but sure. The twist for this film, however, is that there is no twist. I was waiting for it to be revealed that all the newscasts were faked and the four horsemen were really crazy cultists sharing a disillusion, but that moment never comes. When Eric and Andrew step outside, we see planes fall from the sky and lightning striking the ground. It becomes pretty clear that there's no twist coming. But even then, I still hadn't ruled out the possibility that this cabin in the woods may be like a massive soundstage, and that this family was part of some spectator sport for the mega wealthy to watch and make bets on what would happen. And in the final moments of the film, as Andrew and Wynn are leaving the cabin in the horseman's truck, I thought for sure that as Andrew pulled out onto the highway that they'd be like hit by a giant semi-truck or something, making it to where despite having saved the world from the apocalypse, their entire family still died, perhaps as punishment for for allowing all the horsemen to die. But nope, no twist, no big reveal, the movie is very straightforward. And all joking aside, that really is the twist. The movie's designed in a way to make you think like we might be missing something and that a big reveal is coming. But that reveal is that the horsemen were the real deal all along and that there was no big truth to be discovered. You can't handle the truth. Not an M. Night movie, but high five. So let me know, who did you think the mysterious figure in the sunbeams was? What did you think overall of Knock at the Cabin? And were you as impressed as I was with Dave Bautista's acting chops in this very different type of role? Let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, be sure to subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.